Thanks for joining us. This is Ask the Mayo Mom, and I'm Dr. Angela Mackey, pediatrician at the Mayo Clinic Children's Center and host of Ask the Mayo Mom, which is, if you're joining us for the first time, a monthly live interactive show where on Facebook Live where we take questions and discuss common pediatric GI-related issues. Each month I bring on a guest host to help me discuss some of these common concerns and questions in pediatrics, and this month we're going to be discussing pediatric GI-related issues. And I have joining us today Dr. Mark Bartlett, who is a pediatric gastroenterologist at the Mayo Clinic Children's Center, which means that he sees kids with GI concerns. So Dr. Bartlett, thanks for joining us today. Hi, thank you for having me. It's an honor. Great. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself and maybe if you have a special area of expertise? Absolutely. Well, I sort of had a roundabout course to becoming a gastroenterologist. Okay. I actually um, was a general pediatrician after I okay. finished my training back in the 90s, and I spent 12 years as a general pediatrician, okay. so I have a pretty good sense of what you guys do and what kind of questions come up. And then I went back and um, trained as a gastroenterologist, and so I, we see um, all sorts of kids with intestinal complaints, mm -hmm. and um, my niche within that is actually um, taking care of kids with an infection called Clostridium difficile and looking at ways to help them. We're going to get into that a little bit yeah. later. It should be very interesting. We might be talking about sharing poop. Correct. That's right. It's well, before we get started, I think we need to understand a little bit more basic knowledge about the GI tract. So can you explain to us what the purpose of the GI tract is so when we discuss these, these issues, they make a little bit more sense? Absolutely. And I think it's, it's great that you bring that up because I think a lot of people take for granted that our intestine just works and mm -hmm. that it's just there and we don't even think about it as a vital organ like the yeah. heart. And I think a lot of... Um, families and even doctors forget that the GI tract is probably the most important part of the human body. It's funny um, you say that. Everyone, every specialist tells me yeah. that their, their organ is the best. But I did bring along a little um, picture of a friend over here that doesn't even have a heart and lungs, just has a GI tract <laughs> to emphasize that you could be just fine as long as you have your intestines. But most importantly, um, we look at things going all the way from the mouth down the esophagus mm -hmm. to the stomach, and then on through the um, small intestine and colon and on the way out and along the way some of the organs that help with digestion most importantly the liver and the pancreas and the gallbladder and those all contribute to uh, digestion. So basically the GI tract is just one big tube. No, well, I think the tube it's a very sophisticated <laughs> tube. I think you're, you know tube, and yes. a lot of people do think of it right. as a tube but if you mm -hmm. think about it you have to take food from the outside mm -hmm. and then your body has to take it extract all the important things from it and then most importantly figure out what is mm -hmm. useful and what's going to turn into protein and fat and help you grow and then what you need to get rid of and so that's that's a pretty complicated it is pretty system important. so without yeah. the gi tract we wouldn't have any energy we'd have we no energy have, we'd have no in nutrition no. or anything so and we have no fun because eating is fun and important it's too. true it's so. true okay so thanks for you know laying the the groundwork so we can understand um but i think if now it's time to talk about poop um, so one of the most common things I see in the pediatric office um, for concerns with GI related issues is constipation in kids. Um, it's pretty common. Um, can you just explain to us what constipation is? Well, it's a huge concern. I yeah. think, I, I guess um, constipation, most people have a sense of what that is, but mm -hmm. it, it encompasses um, a couple different things because there's just the, the basic mm -hmm. mechanics and physiology of mm -hmm. becoming plugged up with stool. Mm -hmm and not being able to defecate. And then there's all the behavioral mm -hmm. um, stuff that goes along with that and learning and um, being able to adequately stool. Mm -hmm. So it goes beyond just how your intestine and colon works. It also sort of goes into how the child deals with that. Okay. So as a parent, what should you be looking for for signs of constipation in, in, a, in a toddler or in a school age kid? Okay, in older kids. And mm -hmm. I, I think that's great that you separate them out mm -hmm. because obviously constipation, we don't want to downplay how important it is in a newborn, right? right. So if a, for instance, if a child never stools at all, right, right from the get-go, that that worries us that there's really right. something fundamentally wrong with the Absolutely. how the intestine works. But with older kids, I think often there's the, the obvious... Um, fact that they may not be stooling very often. Mm -hmm. I think we would probably define constipation as any stool that's um, really difficult to pass mm -hmm. and that they may not be having it more than, um, they're going more than 48 hours between stools. Okay. 
And we actually use something called the Bristol stool We do, scale, yes. <laughs> which is a, a, a diagram of poop yeah. that helps us um, describe and have, helps parents and kids identify what their stools are looking like. Exactly. That, we like to actually look at pictures of poop and, and, yeah. and to understand kind of what what's going through the body. It's very helpful mm -hmm. for us because we do find that sometimes people say, oh, my kid's constipated right. and they're stooling six times a day. Right little pellets and someone else might mm -hmm. be stooling once every fifth day right. or maybe even every 14th day. Right. So in, in um, school age kids, what kind of symptoms would they have um, for constipation? What I think you look for? by far the biggest thing other than the fact that they're not stooling is abdominal pain. Okay. And if we look at all of the reasons that children have stomach pain mm -hmm. or abdominal pain, constipation is by far number one. Mm -hmm. So that comes up. Absolutely. I feel like it's like numbers one through ten when I'm listening. Absolutely. When, I, when, when I'm thinking of all the things. It's constipation, constipation, constipation until I've ruled out constipation. Exactly. And yeah. sometimes people don't realize that they're constipated because they'll, they'll say, well, my kid is stooling every, every day, day. Mm -hmm. or they're stooling twice a day. Right. But if you can imagine if your entire colon is full up with feces, with yeah. feces yeah. And, um, and you're just kind of, po I think of it like a soft serve ice cream machine. If you're just letting out the last little dollop but you're still plugged up all the way up, then you could still be really uncomfortable. Absolutely. So um, how would you go about making the diagnosis? Well, it's interesting. Constipation really should be um, something that you can get from just talking to the patient and mm -hmm. examining them. So no studies, um, no tests necessarily. Uh, sometimes it's helpful for, for us to just get a plain x-ray. Okay. And I'm sure you find that too, mm -hmm. that when you're just, you can't quite tell if someone is mm -hmm. maybe just, um, more backed up than they realize mm -hmm. that can be instructive and also just as a a visual to show the child and the parent mm -hmm. and say look at how much, how much stool, stool is inside yeah. this person it's going to take a while to get it out absolutely absolutely so you've made the diagnosis what is the best like kind of first and first steps for a treating constipation okay and this is i think this is super important is that we think of treating constipation in sort of two mm -hmm. parts there's the initial evacuation of all the backlog stool mm -hmm. and then there's the second part that is just maintaining mm -hmm. the the situation keeping the stool okay. from accumulating mm -hmm. so we always really when we have a kid that's been chronically constipated mm -hmm. the first thing that we always try to um, the message we really try to impart is the need to get all of that out and we often treat it just like we would um, empty someone out for a colonoscopy clean out mm -hmm and use really high volumes of either um, Miralax mm -hmm. or magnesium citrate mm -hmm. to try to get the patient so they're just stooling out almost watery, clear diarrhea. Start fresh, start with a clean state. start fresh. Yeah. And if someone's been really significantly constipated, sometimes it's uh -huh. even happy then to, uh, helpful to then re-x-ray um, them okay. and just show that they've, they've been emptied out and then you know that you have a starting point. Mm -hmm. And there, then you can work on the maintenance part and I think that sort of there's a combination of nutritional stuff that can help and then the maintenance medications. So nutritional stuff, what are some things that parents could try on their own at home? With um, the foods or the Yeah, with foods, with foods per se, like what are some things that yeah. they can do? And I think, and there's a little bit of um, controversy, but not controversy, but you, mm -hmm. if you asked mm -hmm. 10 gastroenterologists right. you might get slightly different. Sure. Um, words of wisdom from them right. um, but I think one th one thing that I often try to impart is try taking milk out of the diet mm -hmm. um, for at least a month or so and okay. see if it makes a difference okay. because of all the different foods milk is definitely the most constipating mm -hmm. um, some kids have a really strong um, reaction to both bananas and apples mm -hmm. I think most people know that bananas can really plug you up mm -hmm. but apples can kind of go either way mm -hmm. so sometimes they'll give people diarrhea and sometimes they constipate mm -hmm. so I will often emphasize go milk free mm -hmm. and also try no apples and bananas and then add in as much fiber as you can okay. and water is, is hydration and I think water important. is yeah. super important mm -hmm. we all, that's a great mm -hmm. point because mm -hmm. I think we forget that we sort of assume that people, people are drinking, are drinking enough, but yeah. they're not. They're often not. Right. Yeah. So if kids, um, if you're taking out the milk in their diet and that makes a difference, does that mean that they have an allergy to milk or is it just a sensitivity or is it neither? I don't, I wouldn't, certainly yeah. wouldn't call it an allergy. Yeah. And so that's milk important. allergy, I think that's yeah. really important because right. sometimes those terms linger with a kid for a mm -hmm. long time and then they're that's branded right. as being right. milk allergic and then right. later on it's like, oh no, it was just right. constipating. Right. So usually a milk allergy is going to give a like a small baby will have bleeding from a milk allergy in their stool. Mm -hmm. And um, older people might have, if they're really allergic to it, they're gonna have more um, 
allergic symptoms like an itchy mm -hmm. mouth or maybe a lot of vomiting. Mm -hmm. But if you're just constipated, I think that's just a sensitivity. Okay, sounds good. I think that's definitely a good point yeah. to have because we don't want those labels to stay with kids, um, especially going into yep. school and restrictions and diet and stuff. And, and it doesn't apply to everybody. So mm -hmm. you know, so, so we may recommend it. That's the important thing, I think, with when you're initially starting out is to, um, and what frustrates you as well and me sometimes is we'll, people will recommend something yeah. and then we don't hear from people. Right, right. And then... Mm -hmm they kind of forget about it and then about eight months later yeah. they're still constipated yeah. so I always think it's when you're addressing something like this yeah. follow up with your pediatrician or your gastroenterologist frequently in the beginning so we sort of know what's working yeah. what's not. and it's not and I think so much of um, what how we practice in medicine is, is on what we call the patient portal so which yep. is a lot of a lot of medical institutions will have some secure sort form of messaging that you can talk to your to, to your um, doctor with, and we don't, we don't do email here at the Mayo Clinic with, with patients, but through the portal, and you can do so much mm -hmm. um, adjustments at home where you don't need to necessarily come in to, to see your, your provider, so. Absolutely. Okay, so we, are there any um, red flags with constipation of things that, that would make you concerned that there might be something underneath the surface that we're missing? Really good point. So yeah. I think the first, the first message I, I mentioned before was constipation right from the get-go in a newborn infant is very important. So if a child hasn't stooled in the first 48 mm -hmm. to 72 hours, we really worry about a disease called Hirschsprung's disease where the nerves to the colon didn't even develop in the first place. Okay. In older kids, I would be concerned about somebody that's um, so constipated that they're throwing up. Mm -hmm. That worries me. Or if constipation is associated with um, weight loss, mm -hmm. because sometimes constipation is a um, symptom of another disease. So right. celiac disease, which is a um, yes. an inability to, um, to um, consume gluten mm -hmm. and wheat that will usually present as diarrhea and weight loss but sometimes it presents as constipation right. hypothyroidism can show up so we typically by the time someone comes to pediatric gi yeah. and they're coming in for a second or third opinion we'll always that i'll always check for celiac disease hypothyroidism and i'll check inflammatory markers to make sure it's not part of crohn's disease or inflammatory bowel disease okay. but again most of the time those are normal mm -hmm and then we feel more confident. But I have had a few, I would say every year I have a few kids where they are really hypothyroid. Okay. And then actually, then at least you feel like you have something right. specific you can do. Right. Or they have celiac disease, in which case you're gonna go um, gluten-free. Which changing their diet can completely absolutely. help with their constipation. Yeah. Yep. Right. But okay. that's not the typical situation. Yeah, absolutely. So we have a couple of um, great questions here from the audience. So does sensitiv sensitivity to constipation change over child development? That's an interesting question. Yeah, I know. It's, yeah. I guess we could interpret it as yeah. a, one particular child's development, or M maybe. Or how does it if, fit with? How about if they're still constipated in, or they're constipated in, in early childhood? Does that mean they're always going to continue to be constipated? Not at all. Okay. So there's plenty, of, and I think that it's a great question because there's a lot of people that are constipated. Mm -hmm. You identify that there's a problem. Right. We get all the stool out with high volumes of Miralax. Get get mm -hmm. the diet adjusted. Maybe have them on daily Miralax, mm -hmm. and they do great. Right. But there's some people where it's kind of been puttering along for mm -hmm. years and we'll have occasionally we'll kids can develop something that's really a um, unfortunate situation called encopresis mm -hmm. I don't know if that's a term that families know at home but basically that's you're reaching a point where you have been so constipated and um, that your colon is stretched and the kids don't even realize that that the stools there and mm -hmm. it just kind of starts leaking out so that's a super frustrating situation um, that we try to nip in the bud earlier mm -hmm. because if they go through years of that it can take a long time to Absolutely. To fix. Um, we have another um, question here. It says, how common is constipation during infancy? And so I think what they're wondering is, like, what's the typical stool pattern for a newborn infant, yeah. like a breastfed newborn infant? No, and I think that's a great point, mm -hmm. too. So, again, um, you know, the, the severely constipated kid is going to declare themselves as, like, mm -hmm. with Hirschsprung's disease, and that would mm -hmm. be worrisome. But there's a there's a real variety. I'm sure you see mm -hmm. this as a mm -hmm. um, general pediatrician. I know I did that. Um, for instance, some kids that are um, breastfed will be stooling six to eight times a day, and then they might add a um, supplemental formula in maybe around f four or five months, mm -hmm. and they'll suddenly seem really constipated. Mm -hmm. Also, even a purely breastfed kid, sometimes right around a month or two, they'll really change from going really mm -hmm. frequently to going infrequently. Sometimes that's just normal physiology. Mm -hmm. right. um, so I think if a kid is... If a baby is stooling less frequently, yeah. but there's no weight loss, there's no bleeding, right. I think that's probably just a, probably a normal variant. Stools are still soft yeah. and those kind yeah. of things. Yeah, absolutely. 
Um, our next question kind of leads us to the, the next topic. So the opposite of constipation is diarrhea. Yeah. Um, and this question leads to kind of treatments for chronic diarrhea. So let's get to that question in a second okay. and kind of talk about general diarrhea to start yeah. with. Um, so what everyone kind of has different um, thresholds for what they consider diarrhea. Yeah. What is the actual definition of diarrhea? I think that, and again, mm-hmm. that varies, but I think that most of the definitions of diarrhea are you have to have more than three loose stools daily for um, a number of days. Okay. And we usually consider um, three days of loose stools as um, probably diarrhea, and mm-hmm. then it becomes chronic at around 10 days. Okay. Um, what, what are some red flags with diarrhea? Um, so when should you bring your child in to see their, their provider when they're having diarrhea? No, great Is question. there like a length of time? Yeah, I think yeah. for the most part, since, since the bulk, if we took all, com- mm-hmm. all kids that have diarrhea in this right. country yeah. this year, right. um, most of them are going to be sick just from a virus that's going to last for three to ten days, mm-hmm. right? And we're going to get a lot of phone calls, and that's fine. And there's going to be plenty of parents that are worried that their kid's going to get dehydrated. Mm-hmm. So early on, um, the biggest thing is going to be hydration status, as mm-hmm. you know. So if even if it's only been a few days, if a kid looks really limp and listless and not losing keen, weight, then yeah. it's not like mm-hmm. they have to sit at home and say, oh, I can't call my doctor till exactly. day four, right? right? right. But um, for the most part, if they're able to keep them hydrated, mm-hmm. they're going to do fine. And mm-hmm. I think we, ha- we see a lot of, um, I don't want to say over-medicalization, but we know that a lot of people and p- parents share our frustration, mm-hmm. right? They come in, yeah. they say, my kid's had diarrhea for right. two days, and right. we say... It's probably a virus. We're not going to check any labs yet. We're not going to worry. So I'd worry about weight loss. I'd worry in all kids with bloody diarrhea. Mm -hmm. What can Um, that that represent? So a couple things. So infants with bloody diarrhea, Mm -hmm. really early on, we worry about salmonella infections. That's kind of part of, that's an infection that's dangerous for the very young, but not older. A bacterial bacterial infection. Mm -hmm. Um, Another bacteria, the other bacteria that can cause infections are E. coli and Shigella, and then there's... um, Clostridium difficile, yeah. and then there's, um, you know, occasionally if we have a kid that has bloody diarrhea, mm-hmm. we check for all the infection, infectious causes and don't find one, mm-hmm. then we, we're concerned that that could be inflammatory bowel disease, which is um, Crohn's or ulcerative colitis. Okay. But again, those, I would emphasize, those tend to be more in a, you know, chronic kid that's losing weight, a lot of bleeding. Those are the kids we have to look into it more. Okay. Um, so let's say a child's been having diarrhea going on for a week or more. Um, is there a certain point, even if, if there's no red flags, that we would start to look for causes, um, like doing stool studies? Yep, I like absolutely would. Yeah, mm-hmm. and I think that the trend here at um, Mayo is we, do, we have a um, screen that we do for stools mm-hmm. now yeah. that looks for a whole bunch of um, um, what we call PCR tests, looking mm-hmm. for evidence that the that infection's there. So it's kind of a, a simple test, and we tend to also check for... Um, Cryptosporidia, Giardia, and um, Clostridium difficile. Okay. Mm-hmm. So Clostridium, Clost- Clostridium difficile, or yeah. C. diff, is, is what um, you can kind of abbreviate to, is um, something that's got a, some press over the last yeah. couple of years because we're seeing more and more infections of it. Can you tell us a little bit more about C. diff? Yeah, absolutely. So Clostridium difficile actually wasn't even identified till the late 70s as really? a pathogen, although it had been around. Yeah. And it's a bacteria that probably hangs out in small amounts in a lot of us. Mm -hmm. Like if we just went around and had a really sensitive test to check for everybody, Mm -hmm. you're going to find that you or I might have a little bit of C. diff in our system, Mm -hmm. right? Right. And it's fine. It doesn't bug us. But what happens is when the, um, sometimes when the normal bacteria in our intestinal tract get wiped out, either from sort of a change in, um, Change sometimes it's just a change mm-hmm. in the flora mm-hmm. themselves. A lot of times it's because they've been on other antibiotics, like for an ear infection or mm-hmm. pneumonia or sinusitis. Okay. Wipes out the other bacteria, and then the Clostridium difficile kind of take over. Okay. And it just leads to a lot of um, diarrhea in, yeah. in adults. So classically, like an, a, a sick adult in mm-hmm. an intensive care unit, for instance, they'll have horrible bloody diarrhea. A lot of kids will just have the diarrhea without the blood. Okay. So that's one of the reasons why we check for it when diarrhea is going on yeah. for a while. Yeah. Okay. So what are, um, why do we care if there's a C. diff infection? Um, what are some of the consequences of it? Yeah. So it can be, um, the, it can be very, if you don't get rid of it, then it's, it's, it's really hard to restore all the other normal healthy bacteria to the GI tract. And so you'll end up, the diarrhea just persists and persists and persists. And so people will have just... Mm-hmm diarrhea that doesn't go away, they'll ultimately get dehydrated. Mm -hmm. Um, People actually, you know, they'll slowly be bleeding, become anemic, Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of pain and discomfort. 
So we get, you know, before, before people go on to become dehydrated and anemic, usually the mm -hmm. kids and the parents are noticing just diarrhea that won't go away. It's just horribly annoying. It smells horrible. Mm -hmm. And it's just um, all around unpleasant. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So, um, so one of the risk factors is antibiotics. Um, is it recently being on antibiotics. What's the treatment for it? So, the, so the, right. So the first treatment is yeah. is always to um, look at possible things that could be um, causing it. So mm -hmm. take away the antibiotics that are caught, that maybe have led to it in the first place. Okay. Sometimes also being on acid blockers sets okay. people up. So the proton pump inhibitors that mm -hmm. more and more people are on can sort of um, get in the way. Mm -hmm. So you stop those, and then we'll usually the first line medicine is something called Flagyl, which is an antibiotic. Yeah. There's another antibiotic, and a lot of times that doesn't work. Then okay. we have to look at some other more drastic approaches. This is my favorite part. What What is the next step then? And this is also your area of expertise. It is, yeah. yeah so we love yeah. to talk about this, yeah. and I could talk about this for, yeah. you know, for the next two hours, but yeah. hopefully. This blows people's <laughs> minds. Tell no, us what the treatment is. So, is really, so the treatment, if, if it's hard to get rid of C. diff, then the only way we can get rid of it is with a fecal transplant. So which, we have to, which means? So we actually have to take <laughs> stool from a healthy person uh -huh. and get that stool into the person who has the chronic C. diff. So you can imagine there's a couple different ways to do that, right? Right. Um, <laughs> classically, most people don't want to drink or eat somebody's poop. Right. And also the area that's the most affected is in down in the colon, right? Mm -hmm. So if you imagine, we're trying, like, if we look at our map again, if mm -hmm. you, we're trying to get the um, most of that mm -hmm. into the colon. So we found the most um, direct route is to actually do it via colonoscopy. And so then we're able to check somebody look at somebody's colon first and then actually infuse the stool that we've taken from a healthy person into the colon. Do you usually just do one one um, transplant? Is that usually enough to help? Yes, for Clostridium oh. difficile about um, even people that have had recurrent versions that are hard to eradicate, mm -hmm. um, there's a over 90% success with one fecal wow. transplant, yeah. Where do you get the poop from to That's transplant? a great question. Yeah, when we first started out and we were, and we can't take credit as being the initiators of yeah. this at all, right? It right. was been done in the um, adult community for longer and there mm -hmm. were some other places that started off doing pediatric before us. Mm -hmm. um, but we um, originally used parents and family members. Okay. We used some brothers and sisters and we would screen them to make sure they don't have any infections okay. and didn't have C. diff themselves. Or, um, okay. And then collect that, but it, that can be cumbersome because you're yeah. always checking. So we've ac we actually developed a program where I have some um, healthy donors where we collect their stool. Wow. Um, and we have them um, it all um, processed in advance, uh -huh. and it's just in a freezer. Wow. Um, and then when somebody needs a fecal transplant, they can actually just use that wow. if they want. So we have a, right now we have a choice where we let people either use the um, – they could say, you know what, I'd rather use my mm -hmm. mom's or my sister's, or I'd like to go with the anonymous donor. Okay. And we're trying to figure out if one of those is better, yeah. and I, I don't know if there is a difference yet. Are you doing an active study on yeah, anything we do related a, to this? Yeah, okay. we do have an active study that's actually got, you know, been approved through the, um, through the um, National Institutes of Health and gone through the IRB and everything, and we're actually trying to compare um, two groups of 25 each. And right now we, right now the... The biggest problem is they're all successful, mm -hmm. and so we're trying to look at more subtle things to figure out, you know, do we have a better, mm -hmm. um, better elimination of inflammation in one group over the other. So one question we have is, um, have you heard of being a carrier for C. diff? I think you touched on yeah. this, but maybe just a little bit more in detail. No, I think it's a good question, because yeah. sometimes we'll have a kid that keeps getting sick. Right, does and it mean we it found, And yeah. sometimes yeah. the, um, we'll, so we will actually check the family, okay. and there might be like a mom or dad that hasn't yeah. really been that sick, okay. but they have, C. diff that's been um, right. hanging out in their system without making them symptomatic. Absolutely. So I think as a provider, we have to be careful about who we're, we're testing for C. diff, yep. too. So we don't want to be testing someone for C. diff if they have no symptoms of C. diff, exactly. too. Exactly. Because that could result in inappropriate use of antibiotics and um, could lead to other side effects down the road. You're so. absolutely right. I think the key is mm -hmm. we, we're really only mm -hmm. interested in C. diff in people with diarrhea. Absolutely. Because we've had some people where... They've had, for instance, chronic abdominal pain, mm -hmm. and we find that they have C. diff, and mm -hmm. that's probably not why they have the pain. Absolutely. It's probably just there. Um, we have one other question since we're getting close to the end of our time, and we okay. had so many topics I we know, didn't even get a chance to go to. to. We just talked about <laughs> diarrhea and poop. Um, so this question is about, what about using Carol syrup for babies with constipation? Um, is that something you'd recommend? I think, you know, Carol syrup went out of style when there were some concerns about botulism, was my understanding, right, mm -hmm. is because mm -hmm. there, there's 
a theoretical mm -hmm. risk that you could give botulism to a small person mm -hmm. with caro syrup. So I've never really used it. I mm -hmm. think there's probably a lot of things like that that people do at home mm -hmm. that are not sure. particularly dangerous. I mean, that doesn't sound alarming to right. me to use caro syrup. So by using I the caro syrup, they're just kind of creating I, a diarrhea by how much? I think you're just kind of creating yeah. a, yeah. a, it's Increased like a sugar, sugar. load. Yeah. yeah, and I think that sort of gets back to when you look at all the old methods like caro mm -hmm. syrup, mineral oil was something that mm -hmm. was used a lot when I first started out 20 right. years ago. Yeah. And we sound like broken records about Miralax, but it's yeah. just so much yeah. easier and right. palatable than all these other right. things that and safe that we just yeah. rarely go beyond it. I think a lot of times I'm, I, I need to just reassure families that Miralax is safe. Yeah. And it's safe to be used long term and chronically for years in people um, in small amounts. We believe Actually, so, mm -hmm. yeah. I think mm -hmm. that's a, it's a, mm -hmm. it's a valid point to and people are, are actively looking at that, and I think right. I think that we have no reason to suspect that it's a dangerous okay. medication. Sounds good. Well, since we are nearing the end of our time, is there any resources for parents that you would direct them to if they have GI questions or concerns with yeah, their children? Yeah, I think that we have a great um, national organization that a lot of families don't know about. It's mm -hmm. called NASPAGAN. It has sort of an unfortunate <laughs> acronym, but it's the North American <laughs> Society of Pediatric Gastroenterology. Mm -hmm hepatology mm -hmm. and nutrition. Mm -hmm. So it's N-A-S-P-G-H-A-N, NASPGAN. Mm -hmm. If you go on that, there's tons of resources and they have we have really good protocols for um, pediatricians mm -hmm. and also for families. And I think it's underused, but we're trying to make, uh, make sure that people are aware of it because oftentimes you can answer questions using that. Absolutely. Um, the Mayo Clinic uh, org site also has a lot Absolutely. of information yeah. um, regarding GI questions, concerns, constipation, diarrhea, when should I bring my kid to the doctor questions, so I check those out. Um, the Mayo Clinic YouTube channel also has a lot of great stuff in regards to, especially inflammatory bowel disease. Mm -hmm. um, we have a lot of information on pediatric inflammatory bowel disease, Absolutely. so you have yeah. questions about that. And there's actually um, ibdblog.mayoclinic.org yeah. as well as another site for families. So That's thank true. you for having oh. or for, or for coming today. Oh, yeah. um, it was it was great. I feel like I learned something too. Okay. We'll have to have you back <laughs> sometime. Just barely scratched the surface. I know. Of we didn't get to talk about <laughs> reflux and all those other best, things. It's the best topic. It is. <laughs> Most important organ. Most important. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, um, thanks for joining us today. Next month Month, we'll be having on two of our pediatric urologists, Dr. Granberg and Dr. Um, Patricio Gar Gargaloa, and we will be talking especially about fertility preservation um, in children undergoing chemotherapy, and uh, as well as other pediatric urology issues. So please join us. Um, we'll be tweeting those dates and times coming up. Have a great day.